Okay, so, well, first I would like to start thanking the organizer for the invitation here at this conference to speak and to follow all the other uh, talks. So, I would like to talk about self-induced disorder. So, first, I'm sorry, the self-induced disorder in this talk is not the same self-induced disorder of in the Jean-Philippe Bouchot talk. We use the same term, uh, but it's not the same, as you will see. So, it will be... Um, Something, my talk will be something like two-thirds still uh, an historical perspective because understanding self-induced disorder, which actually means try to construct an effective theory for the thermodynamics of glasses, is a work done by many different people. And then at the end, I will try to, uh, I will tell you more about some recent results. Uh, so my work on, on this topic has been uh, a I'd say, long series of work with uh, Gilles Tarjus, Marco Tarsi, and Chiara Camarota and then recently also with Ludovic Bertier and Misaki Ozawa. Okay, so let me start uh, first with uh, adding up something to uh, what Jean-Philippe said. Um, so the, uh, if you look at the, at the grass transition, something that emerges as a natural order parameter is what is called the overlap. So first, if you look at the uh, typical correlation function, what you see is that when you decrease the temperature in a supercool liquid, you have a plateau that is forming, and this plateau, if there is an ideal grass transition, will become infinite at a certain finite temperature. So what you have here, I mean, the physical content of, of a correlation function, what is measuring at equilibrium, is comparing the state of a, the system at time zero with the state of the system at time t. And it tells you how much, actually, the system goes away from the configuration at time zero. And uh, I mean, there are many correlation functions that you can study. You can, for example, this is one example. And in general, I call them overlap because they measure how much the configuration at time t is different from the configuration at time zero. If there is a glass transition, then at infinite times, the system will not be able to decorrelate, so to have an overlap zero from the initial configuration. This means that since the initial configuration break translation invariance has some kind of amor amorphous uh, density profile. This means there will be an amorphous density profile at infinite times. So, well, this is the definition of the overlap. And so, as uh, Jean-Philippe said, one very useful construction in the theory of the glass transition is the Franz Parisi potential introduced by uh, Sylvia and George in 95. And the idea of the Franz Parisi potential is completely thermodynamic. So, another disclaimer, my, on my talk, I will focus actually on thermodynamics, even though I think dynamics is extremely important, but I think it's more difficult. So, well, we, I will focus on thermodynamics on my talk. So, the Franz Parisi potential is constructed in this way. You take an equilibrium configuration, you pick at random with the Boltzmann measure, and then you want to measure the probability that if you pick another configuration at random with the Boltzmann measure, it has, a prob it has an overlap Q with the initial configuration at equilibrium. So in equation, this is what you do. You, this is the equilibrium configuration you pick at random. And here you make a sum over all configuration with the Boltzmann weight and the constraint that the overlap with C equilibrium is equal to small q. So this has a form, actually, if you compute it, as a form of a large deviation function, meaning that you can write it like an exponential of minus n, the number of degrees of freedom, and the kind of free energy, which is a function of q. And this is the form that you get when you compute this uh, free, uh, free Franz Parisi potential in a mean field model of, uh, of the glass transition. So what you see is that at high temperature you have something like this, then at, when you decrease the temperature you have a second, secondary minimum that emerge, and then at, at the glass transition temperature that emerge at, in, in, within mean field, the secondary minimum becomes equal in height to the first minimum at overlap zero. So the physical content of this uh, behavior is the following. So when, when, you are, when you decrease the temperature at a certain point when the system is still liquid, you, have, but you start to have many different metastable states. So if you pick the first configuration uh, at random, it will follow, in, let's say, in one of them, in one of the uh, metastable equilibrium uh, uh, state. And then when you pick the other configuration, well, the other configuration has two possibilities. Either it falls in one of the other metastable states. This is the best way because all the other metastable state has the same free energy, but you have many, so you gain entropy. So this is what the system wants to do. So this is why the minimum here is at overlap zero. But then there is the second possibility that the second configuration C fall in the same uh, state than the configuration C equilibrium. 
And if this happens, well, this is why you have the secondary minimum. And then you have a barrier between the two because, well, if you, both configurations are here, if you force the configuration C to go out from this minimum, then you are going to pay because they are not still gaining all the entropy of all the other metastable state and you are losing energy. So, well, this is what you find in, uh, within midfield theory. Uh, within, you see that within this description, you have a very simple description of the glass transition, which actually resembles a lot what you find in a first order transition. In a first order transition, when you do Landau theory, you have these two minima, and the first order transition happens when the two minima became of the same eight. So, for example, in the Eisen model, in a field, and here the analogy will be the overlap play the roles of the magnetization, and this, the difference between the two minima, which is really how much you pay when you constrain one configuration to be in the same state of the configuration C equilibrium, what you pay is the configurational entropy, because you lose all the entropic factor of putting the configuration in the other states. So the difference here is the configurational entropy. So you see that the configurational entropy plays the role of the magnetic field, and the transition takes place when the configurational entropy is zero. So within this description, it's, it's nice because it's simple. You can uh, well understand several things. For example, you can understand mod coupling theory like uh, a spin nodal transition, but I will not go into that. And the nice thing also is that this is something that you can, in principle, measure. So this is what you get within mean field theory, but then you can say, okay, if all this construction has a meaning, uh, take a uh, real three-dimensional system and try to measure it. This is something that you can do. And this actually has, uh, has been done. I mean, there have been first paper in 2013, and there are still work going on, and I think uh, Ludovic will, will talk about this. There is still many things to, uh, to do on this, but the nice, uh, I mean, the nice answer is that actually you can see actually this kind of uh, behavior in finite dimension with, of course, the change that, I mean, this thing has to be convex in finite dimension. But you, you can really see that there is some kind of first order phase transition like behind the physics of glasses if you look at the uh, overlap. Now, this is what you get within mean field theory. So if you want to try to construct an effective theory like in standard phase transition, you would like to go from mean field theory to a theory in which the other parameter fluctuates in space. So if we, well, since we say that the order parameter is the overlap, the, what we would like to have is a field theory on the overlap. So uh, uh, constructing a field theory on the overlap field. So in principle, this is, let's say, in words, is easy to do. So you want to go from the partition function, which is an integral over the position of all particles, to the partition function written like a functional integral over the different overlap fields. In principle, again, this is, at least is well defined, so it means that you have an integrate over all the position of all the particle at fixed overlap field, and this will give you a weight, which is just the action of your field theory. So the overlap field is just, well, it's just the generalization of the overlap in which P of X tell you how much the configuration C uh, resembles configuration C equilibrium around position X. So, well, this is the definition of the action. Now, the problem is, well, to compute it. So understand what is this, this action uh, in terms of the overlap field. So, well, I'm constructing from first principle is, is really complicated. I will tell you more uh, later. But what you can do is you can also guess what are the important terms in this action. And as you do in standard phase transition, well, if you know what mean field theory is, well, the first term that you would guess that this uh, action should have is an integral over dx of the potential that you get within mean field theory. Because in mean field theory, you know that correspond to taking the overlap field constant. So the overlap field constant, you want to have the Franz Parisi potential. So this is the analogy, is what you would get and what you would do naturally in a, also in Landau theory. Then another term that you would put naturally is that you are going to pay something if you have fluctuation of the overlap field. This is quite natural, but it's, since the overlap field is not something very intuitive, it's also good that you can get it from, again, first principle. If you, do a, if you study Katz model, as, for example, has been done for Van der Waals theory, to go from Van der Waals theory to, uh, let's say, more finite dimensional uh, analysis of the liquid gas uh, transition, here you can do the same. You can take models of which, within mean field theory, gives you the glass transition. And then you do a cuts, uh, a cuts version, and in, which correspond to have a very weak interaction, which is very long range. 
And in the limit, in the cut limit, you can see that the action is roughly is has a term like this with a gradient square, and then here you have a term like this, and then you have some correction. Okay, but this is the gist of it. So starting from this action, you can get many things that Jean-Philippe discussed and which brings uh, theory of glasses from mean field theory to finite dimension. So first you find really that the glass transition within this formulation is like a first order transition in the overlap field. And now what does it mean? It means, for example, that if there is a glass transition, it means that if I fix the overlap to one at the boundary of the system, this will fix the, the overlap at, let's say, very high in the center of the box which now in terms of position of particles, it means that if I take an equilibrium configuration and then I take another one and I put the only constraint is that the position of the particle on the boundary of the box is very close to the one on the equilibrium configuration, then the position of the particle in the center of the box, very far away from the boundary condition, has been set to a large extent to be very close to the position of the particle in the equilibrium configuration. So this really means that once you have this first order transition, you get long range amorphous order in the system. Then you can get, starting from this, that you can get that there is a point to set length that will diver diverge uh, when you approach the glass transition, that here becomes just a nucleation length, as Jean-Philippe discussed. And you can also discuss the dynamical length uh, in terms of a spinodal transition. So this is, again, it's part of the review. And what I would like to tell you is that this is not, this is not enough. So this is what you get, but there is something missing, clearly. And something, the thing which is missing is what I call the self-induced disorder. And what it means is that here in this action, you see that you have the equilibrium configuration that I pick at the beginning. And so this actually induce, this means that this action actually is a random functional. So it's, it, there's, it contains, in principle, randomness. And the, let's say intuitively, what it means is that if I look locally, uh, at the configuration C equilibrium. This configuration locally can be, uh, for example, very well packed. The, po the particle position can have a very low energy structure. And in another region, instead, they can have a very high energy structure. So what this means is that the Franz Parisi potential is expected to fluctuate, if you define locally, to fluctuate from a position to the other. And then also you can think that actually the stiffness, uh, so this, uh, what you pay uh, if you want to uh, break uh, uh, flat profile in the overlap will also fluctuate in space. What this means is that what you expect is that add to this action you should add some random terms and it's natural to think that these random terms, since this is a scalar field, will, will correspond to some kind of random field and random bound terms. So it means that this is like a first order phase transition in which you have also random bound and random field terms. So this idea is something that has been thought and uh, discuss and work by several people. So here, this, this is not an exhaustive list of reference. Uh, I just, while well, there are several, I would just want to point out two that I, I, I like in particular. So there are the pioneering works of uh, Peter that really, well, first uh, introduced phenomenologically this idea that the configurational entropy fluctuates in space. And then in this paper, he started really to think about what is the uh, effective theory of glasses and the fact that it has to contain random field and random bone terms. And then there is uh, actually uh, this paper by Silvio Giorgio, Federico, and Tommaso, in which they really actually were able to, uh, let's say, to, to show what is the effective theory in, uh, in, a very, in a first principle way, so really analyzing the field theory for, and they do it for when they were studying the uh, effective theory for the mod coupling transition. And they show that the effective theory for the mod coupling transition is a spinodal in a random field, the one of the spinodal in a random field. And there was no approximation, they were just studying the field theory. So it was really something which we went from, let's say, phenomenological arguments to, some, uh, to, to an analytical treatment. And then there have been many other works. So while this is just for, let's say, the intuition, now, uh, to summarize many of the works and to put in the context of, in general, of the glass transition, I would like to discuss them in the, what is called the temperature uh, epsilon coupling phase diagram. So here, epsilon is what is called epsilon coupling. Again, it was introduced by, uh, I think, uh, Silvio and Giorgio. Uh, so it's the coupling between the reference. So what you can do is that in the partition function that I... Uh, 
okay, that I define here, you can add an extra term, which is a coupling between the configuration C and the equilibrium configuration C equilibrium. So what this coupling uh, does is that it tilts the potential. So if you, may, if you put a coupling between the two configuration, then the configuration which is with a high overlap will gain, and so you can put down this minimum. So the role of the uh, epsilon coupling is really like putting an extra magnetic field that uh, favor the first order transition. So what you have in the phase diagram then is that if you, in general, liquids live on this line, so there is no epsilon coupling, you decrease the temperature at a certain point, maybe there is an ideal glass transition. Now if you're here where you can do simulation, for example, uh, the liquid is still uh, a liquid, so it's not a glass. Now if you increase epsilon, what happens is that you are, now you start to tilt the potential, so if there is indeed a potential, you should have at a certain point the uh, high overlap uh, state becomes favorable and win in free energy. And so you should have, you should see a first order transition between a low overlap state to a high overlap state. And this is something that again will be discussed by Ludovic. There have been simulation of this phase diagram which are uh, with positive results. And so in principle you expect a first order transition line and then uh, that ends in a critical point. It's just a first order transition that ends in a critical point. And since it's a first order transition with disorder, what you expect is that this critical point at the end is, a, is in the new university class of the random field lysing model. And this is, instead, is first order with randomness. Now, the nice thing is that, again, this, the fact that this is in the uh, universality class of the uh, random field lysing model, again, was really proven in this, well, proven in the sense of theoretical physics in this paper, so with no, it's not a phenomenological argument, it seems to be really true, and there have been simulation now in three dimension, and uh, this also, this is something that also we, we studied both here and here to, to uh, show analytically that this is the case. The fact that the mod coupling transition, if you study fluctuation beyond mean field theory, is like a spin order of the random field IZ model, again was studied in this paper and then in, then in others. So, well, like the spin order that does not exist in finite dimension, mod coupling does not exist either in finite dimension. And then, well, so this is just to tell you that this analogy with random field IZ model is, I think it's very solid and has been shown, well, it's intuitively natural and has been shown in a solid way in several parts of the phase diagram. Now, the thing is that what we are interested in really, I mean, all these are confirmation that in a certain sense we are on the right track, but what we are interested in is what happens on this line, because this is where real liquid lives. And what we want to know actually is whether when you approach TK, uh, so the ideal grass transition, whether the description in terms of a first order transition plus random bond and random field is correct. And well, when you try to do this and you start to think about it, then you start to, to feel not so sure, actually. And this is actually what, what, what we work on with uh, Chiara, Marco, and Gilles. Now, the problem here is that, so the idea of getting an effective the theory is that you say there is a first an important uh, field, which is the overlap, and then all the other degrees of freedom are not relevant, so I can integrate out them. And then I get an effective bare action, and then what I have to do, I have to study the fluctuation of the field with this action. Now, there is something that can go wrong, is that you integrate out the degrees of freedom, and you get an action which is long range, uh, which actually becomes more and more long range the more you approach the transition. And this means actually that you have integrated out degrees of freedom that they were re relevant. You didn't have any right to integrate them out to get the uh, uh, correct effective theory. And actually it seems, at least at first sight, that this is actually what happens when you approach TK. The reason, well, one way to see it, and I will be a little bit quick, but you can ask me more later, is that imagine that you take an overlap field which is one outside a cavity and zero inside a cavity. So you fix that the particle has to be in a configuration which is, has overlap zero or very low with the equilibrium configuration in the cavity and is one outside the cavity. Then uh, this constraint for the particle, so if you have many, many metastable states, what you are asking is that inside the cavity I have to be in a metastable state which is different from the one of the equilibrium configuration, but at the boundary should be the same. So from the point of view of the particle in the cavity, it's a little bit like putting a random boundary condition. And while we know that if you put random boundary condition and you let the equilibrate particle inside, 
you have a finite size glass transition. So you, have, you see that the behavior, the system behave in different ways if you are above or below the point to set. And what this means is that, in principle, what I should find if I fix the, the, the overlap field like this, I should find if everything is correct that I pay a term which is local here because I'm forcing the system to have an interface, and then, then I pay a term here which is difference, the difference in the Franz Parisi potential. But what I discover actually is that uh, in reality, the action, the bare action, feels the existence of the point to set, which is very bad because in principle, what I would like to do is that taking fluctuation over the bare action, I discover the point to set. Not that the point to set, so the, the important length is inside the action itself. So it's a little bit so this way. So we try to find the length with an action, and then the action has the length, the length in it, which seems to say that the effective theory is maybe it's not correct. So this is, so what we try to do is try to go, uh, to construct again the, what is the correct effective theory when you approach the glass transition? And while well, I have to uh, cut a long story short, but what we try to do is to, uh, well, first we try to compute the, uh, since this actually is a functional, it's a random functional, we compute its average and its second moment. And then we want to see what is the, from, from this, what is the effective theory that we have to use when we, approach, when we approach the glass transition. Now, we cannot do this from first principle without approximation, it's impossible. So we did several approximations. For the first, we want to we consider the overlap as a two-state variable, which I think is not a big approximation, so zero, one, meaning higher or low overlap. And then, in principle, what we want to do is, given an overlap field, we want to integrate out all the other degrees of freedom but we are not able to do this for all overlap field. So we focus just on some overlap field. So for example, an overlap field which are, let's say one here and zero here, or one here and zero here. And then we want to see what is the uh, contribution that we get to the action. Again, we are not able to integrate uh, really all, all the other degrees of freedom. So we do an variational approximation actually on, on the other degrees of freedom that we integrate out at fixed P of X. And the result, what we get using what is called the free replica sum theory, which has been developed by uh, Gilles and Mathieu Tissier for the random field Ising model, is that the effective theory is the one of the random field random bond Ising model, as was expected, plus extra term. And the extra term are long range antiferromagnetic interaction plus infinite range for spin scuppling. And now, well, what I wanted to uh, tell you uh, is what are the, the consequences actually on the either grass transition that we find analyzing those terms. So first, the long range antiferromagnetic interaction push down the, uh, the glass transition temperature, but in principle, it does not destroy the glass transition. So it just disfavor a, a bit uh, the glass transition, but just push, push it down. The infinite range force spin coupling too is not dangerous actually, it does not destroy the glass transition by itself but may change actually the scaling of the point to set in a way that for the moment we, we don't know. And then while the discussion of what's the role of the self-induced disorder, I think self-induced disorder is particularly important and this is why also I wanted to, to discuss it in detail because if you have a first order transition in three dimension, if the self-induced disorder is too strong, it destroys the transition, which now by the analogy, it means that the three-dimensional ideal grass transition, if the fluctuation of the Franz Parisi potential are too strong, will be destroyed. So it's really interesting, actually, it will be very interesting to know what is the strength of, this, of the disorder in real glass forming liquids. And the only way to do this, I think, is by simulation. And the nice thing is that now, I think, we have uh, the tools, and we, meaning I mean, the good people in the audience, have the tools to, to do this, and I think Ludovic will, will talk about this. And it would be nice also to understand, depending on the form of the liquid, uh, whether some uh, have strong fluctuation and whether others have not so strong fluctuation. Then the other important consequence is that, as has been proven, actually rigorously, uh, there are no uh, first order transition with disorder, with local disorder in, in two dimension, which means actually now, given the analogy with the random fieldizing model, is that this implies that there, are, there is no two-dimensional finite temperature ideal glass transition. And again, this, thanks to uh, recent breakthrough in simulation, it has been possible to compute the configurational entropy as a function of temperature at very low temperature, 
uh, compared to the, let's say, experimental scale uh, in two-dimensional model of uh, real glass formers. And what has been seen is that the behavior of the configurational entropy as a function of temperature is very different from three dimension. Of course, you always have to do an extrapolation, but if you extrapolate, the extrapolation in three dimension seems to give a finite temperature, and the extrapolation in two dimension seems to give a temperature which is zero, at which the configurational entropy goes to zero. Again, just as the extrapolation, but at least if you look at the behavior of the configurational entropy as a function of temperature, it's clearly different in 3D and 2D, which is, can be a signal that indeed in 2D for sure things are different, and this may, be, from this perspective, is due to the role of the disorder. Now, this is uh, what I wanted to say to on the role of disorder on the glass transition itself. I think the uh, role of the self-induced disorder is important for many aspects of glasses. In particular, one is actually for I glass. Have a question on that. Yep. So what, what is the time scale? How is that diverging? That How the time scale is behaving? Yeah. Yeah. This may be. I think Ludovic has really. Uh, he will talk uh, uh, just later. He has. Uh, he will show figures on this. Okay, so, uh, so the other thing that I wanted to say very briefly, and I'm sorry, but I have no time, so I will, go be, I will go quick, is that the disorder is also important for the glass, for the amorphous solid, not just how glass are formed, but once they are formed, how, for example, they behave and they respond to, uh, resp to uh, deformation. So something that is, has been studied a lot is that uh, how a glass or an amorphous solid fail, uh, so the instability that is induced by uh, shear deformation or uh, uh, shear strain. Uh, sorry, shear strain or shear stress. So this is an instability which is called the yielding transition. It's instability toward plasticity. And now from the point of view, if you do it, if you think in terms of mean field theory, and this has been done in, in, in those works, is that you take a liquid, you, then you equilibrate at a certain temperature, then you quench it, you form the solid, and then you start to deform it. You can always describe the system in terms of overlap which means that I have my configuration, which is unstrained, then I start to strain it, so the overlap, and then I look at the overlap between the strain uh, configuration and the one which is unstrained, and the overlap well, will decrease, and then at a certain point within midfield theory, you have a transition, which is an instability, at which the overlap will jump, and, uh, at this, and this instability is really like a spinodal within midfield theory. Now again, what I say is that even from phenomenological or intuitive argument, this instability is very natural to think that this instability in presence of local, of, in presence of disorder. And so very naturally, you can try to construct a theory of the yielding transition in terms of the zero temperature spinodal of the random field Ising model. So it's nice actually, this connection, because this zero temperature uh, random field Ising model spinodal is also connected with models that have been studied for a long time in plasticity, which are called the elastoplastic model. So in this analogy, uh, what you have is that, so in the uh, random field Ising model, you have the magnetization. When you increase the field, the magnetization, if you start from magnetization minus one, for example, it increases, and then if the disorder is low, it has a jump, and then uh, here is where you have the instability. So in the analogy, the magnetization plays the role of the stress, the external field is the role of the strain, and so what this seems to suggest is that, again, if the disorder is not too strong, then you expect that the yielding transition will be an abrupt phenomenon, which is discontinuous. So the stress will just have a discontinuous jump at the transition. And then instead, if the disorder is strong, here is it's known from the random field uh, spinodal is that there is no transition anymore. So you go from a first order jump of the uh, magnetization, so the stress would be, to a critical point, and then a smooth behavior. So, well, if what we, what we, what we did with uh, Ludovic and, and Mizaki and Gilles is to uh, study this from using a midfield model and studying and using simulation in a realistic model of uh, glass forming liquids. And here is what you find. So these are, you have different curves which correspond to uh, glasses which are more and more stable. So this means that you equilibrate until temperature T and then while well, you quench and uh, the more you go down in temperature, the stable, more stable is the glass. Intuitively, the more you anneal the, the glass, the less disorder you have. And here's the behavior of the stress versus strain. So you see here, you see the very stable, so very low temperature glasses have a big jump of sigma as a function of, ga, of delta sigma, as a function of, of gamma, which is the strain. And instead, the less 
stable is the glass, the smaller is the jump, and at a certain point, the jump disappear. You can also look at the statistics, for example, of this jump of delta sigma, uh, and you see that depending on the stability, so the temperature uh, at which you form the, the glass, you see that you have really a peak here of the fluctuation of delta sigma, which signals the existence of a critical point. So we did other studies that I don't have time really to discuss because I have to wrap up. But what really find, we find, what we find is that really the way in which the system yield uh, is different depending on the stability. And there are, seems to be really two different phases, one which we call brittle, in which you have a discontinuous transition, and one which is ductile, in which you have instead a continuous transition. And between the two, there is a critical point which seems to be in the universality class of the random field Ising model. And so this would separate different systems. So there are systems which are formed in a way which is they are not very well annealed, like, for example, colloidal glasses or foams, and then systems which are more annealed, which present a different behavior. So there are open questions. Some have been discussed, uh, raised uh, before that we are addressing. Of course, long-range anisotropic, anisotropic interactions are important and should be understood. And then maybe these are related to the existence of the shear bands and to the rare droplets that has been found in the random field Ising model. So now we'll conclude. So what I wanted to tell you, and the main message is that if one tries to go beyond the mean field theory of glassing and try to put the uh, uh, finite dimensional effect, one effect which is very important, I think, is the one of self-induced disorder. And it can have a very important effect. First, it can destroy, actually, the glass transition if it's too strong. Uh, in 2D, in principle, says that there is no glass transition, and this seems to be seen in simulation. And then if you look to uh, the property of amorphous solids, then it tells you that there are amorphous solids can have very different behavior depending whether the, the self-induced disorder is strong or weak. Now, Concerning the glass transition, as I show you in the T epsilon phase diagram, it's clearly that there is an emerging RFEM-like physics in many points. Concerning the glass transition itself, it seems from what we did that uh, the effective theory is the one of the random field, random bondizing model, plus some long-range interaction. It seems that this long-range interaction may, I mean, they don't destroy the glass transition by themselves but they may change some critical properties in a way that for the moment we, we are not able to, uh, uh, to get. And then, while well, a disclaimer at the end, all the talk were about thermodynamics. I think that, of course, the most interesting thing in a glass transition is the dynamics, but it's much more, actually much more difficult. I think that the role of self-induced disorder is, can be very, very important in the dynamics. It can explain things like uh, that have been seen, like avalanche of motion, dynamical heterogeneity, facilitation, and for example, shear band in, in yielding, clearly we can construct phenomenological arguments and, uh, or qualitative arguments. Some of them have been done already. So for example, I cited the ones of Peter, and we also have done some with, with, uh, with Gilles. I think it's trying to construct a really dynamical theory that take them into account would be very interesting, but it's, it's work for the future. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Julia. Do we have any questions? So, yeah, so we, ch we chose this, this profile because, <clears throat> in a certain sense, they contain the problem here. So, so the problem that we had here was that the point to set length was in the action, and we didn't want to have in the action. So it was emerging in the action. So we knew that in this, if we took this kind of profile, we would have seen the, the, this effect that I was discussing before. This was why we, choose, we chose them. We wanted to choose some profile in which clearly the problem that we, we found was there. Then, uh, then we take I mean, these two, well, not more, just by, for practical reason. Uh, this was one part of the question, and the other one was... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, overlap of 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, I, I can tell you, well, so let's say, I think that except if there are other, let's say, other problems, which are other potentially dangerous, I mean, here we, we understood that there are potentially dangerous extra fluctuation that I think we can uh, really study with this, with this kind of profile. Maybe there are other that we didn't thought about, and then we should find, we should look at some special profile that would uh, uh, signal their existence. So if there are not others, and I don't see others, uh, then this is enough, but there might be. And it's a question from Jean Philippe here. Yeah, maybe just a short comment. Maybe you should call it self induced heterogeneity rather than self induced disorders. Okay, yes. I don't know. Yeah, 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 I agree. Sylvia? So. So I actually didn't understand your argument. You have already had a point which explains the argument. So, so what I was saying is that imagine that you do, uh, so you, you try to do the, uh, okay, let me see. So imagine that you do a cuts, cuts computation as you did with this kind of profile, one outside and zero inside. Now when you do zero inside and you integrate out, so you have the replica field that you have to integrate, the, the in, say, inner replica uh, for the p equals zero. Okay, and now this, the replica which are here, will have a one RSB transition once the size L becomes smaller than the point to set. So the replica structure of the replica here inside change when you are above or below the point to set. But in principle, you, you don't want, I mean, if, what, so this tells you that uh, in, the, uh, in the action, the action will change uh, when on scale, when you are on scale which are on the order of the point to set. But this is the bare action. So the bare action is not supposed to change. I mean, it's the fluctuation above the, uh, when you take fluctuation using the bare action. So in any case, I mean, the argument was really, if you compute the bare action with this profile, you do it, for example, with the cuts computation, you will see that you have the point to set there. Okay, well, so the, oh. the bare action should be the field. Well, the cuts. Uh, Okay, so I mean the bare action is the uh, is this one, so it will be the cuts, is this one, okay, and the uh, so it has a trans what it has it has a transition as a function of l, so what is surprising is that in principle you don't expect I mean if you just you just look at the profile so just the value of the action you are not taking fluctuation, and you see that you have a, a uh, uh, you have a transition. So the action knows, so if the action was local, it shouldn't know about when L becomes of the order of the point to set. So this means that the action is not local, actually. Wow. Well, oh, more questions. There are, there are other solids, like Syria, for example. Like? Uh, Syria. Syria is Syria element. Uh, it has a bottom pass critical point. Mm -hmm. So, so the uh, okay. So well, first the, the part of first part of the answer. So the long range effect does not come from elasticity no. in our case. No, it's really, and in principle, uh, I, I don't think so that they, they will give the classical mean field exponent. Okay. Final yeah. question from Peter. Well, this was a In the interface. In the interface between the people's one and the people's zero region. And I, I think that that's similar to saying we have problems on the point to set length scale. Uh, we think that's the same thing as the wedding phenomenon. 
Yeah, well, I think this, this is, tells you that, I mean, the, one has to be careful even with the interface. I mean, the effect that I was discussing was really that the action shouldn't know if I take the bare action about the point to set. And if, instead, it does know. So it means that there are some extra, uh, let's say, long range interaction that should appear. What you're saying, I think, is that there should be something which is complicated concerning the interaction. It's not just grad p square, it's, may, it's maybe something more complicated. Well, let's stop now. Let's thank uh, Julia one more time.